On behalf of the Women's Leadership and Resource Center at the University of Illinois Chicago, welcome to our program today, Artists, Activists, Reimagining Justice. We're so happy to have you with us. A little bit about our program. This Women's History Month, WLRC, is hosting dialogues with artists, activists, and educators to explore socially engaged, community-based work and consider questions like, how do women and gender nonconforming artists who are Black, Indigenous, and people of color decide to use their creative skills to bolster social justice movements? How does their work engage racial and economic justice to imagine new possibilities with and for their local communities and beyond? And how do they bring this work into the academy and vice versa? We're thrilled that you've joined us for our first dialogue today, and we hope that you will also join us for our second dialogue with artists Quendalyn A. Barrett and Jian Lee on March 31st. We'll put the link in the chat for that, uh, the link for that in the chat <clears throat> in just a moment. Our presenters today are Aram Hansifuentes and Lisa Wolfork. Aram Hansifuentes is a fiber and social practice artist, writer, and educator who works to center immigrant and disenfranchised communities. Her work often revolves around skill sharing, specifically sewing techniques to create multi-ethnic and intergenerational sewing circles, which become a place for empowerment, subversion, and protest. Solo exhibitions of her work have been presented throughout the country, including at UIC's Jane Addams Hull House Museum, and she has won numerous fellowships and awards. She earned, she earned her BA in Art and Latin American Studies from the University of California, Berkeley, and her MFA in Fiber and Material Studies from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. She is currently an associate professor adjunct at the School of, Art, of the Art Institute of Chicago. Lisa Wolfork is a sewist, podcaster, community organizer, and scholar. She is the founder of Black Women Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. She is also the host and producer of Stitch Please, a weekly audio podcast that centers Black women, girls, and femmes in sewing. In the summer of 2017, she became a founding member of Black Lives Matter Charlottesville, which protested against the white supremacist insurgency that had taken hold of the Virginia city. She organized in a variety of ways, including nonviolent direct action, working with a bail fund for activists, sewing for a creative arts team, and co-founding a media collective. Practicing the unlikely but not unprecedented mix of needle arts and Black liberation, Lisa's sewing and quilting practice operates alongside her schol scholarly inquiry as an associate professor of English at the University of Virginia. Lisa also offers courses in the fields of Black liter literary and cultural studies. So I've, <clears throat> excuse me, I've asked Aram and Lisa to begin by telling us about their journey as artists, how they got started, what some of their major projects have been, their paths to activism, and some of their influences. So Aram, I'd love to start with you and I will hand it off to you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, let me share my slides. Great. So yeah, thank you Ramona for the introduction and thank you to UIC's Women's Leadership and Resource Center for the invitation to speak to you all today. And thank you all for making the time uh, during your lunch hour to come. Um, yeah, and, and it's such an honor to be here with Lisa today, who I greatly admire. Um, so my name is Aram Hansi Fuentes. I use she and they pronouns. So I'm, as Ramona mentioned, I'm a fiber and socially engaged artist, educator, and writer. And really at the core of everything I do, my goal is to disrupt, unsetter, unsettle, and rupture dominant narratives to assert, demand, and claim spaces for those who are commonly other, particularly for immigrants of color. So I work to center immigrants and to center people of color to tell our own stories. So a little bit about me is that, um, and how I came to Fiber, is that it became my medium as an immigrant and as a daughter of garment workers. So at the age of six, my parents, that's the year we immigrated to the United States, my parents started working in dry cleaning and my mom is a seamstress and tailor. So at this young age of six, I learned how to sew. And it is from this very beginning that sewing has been political for me and linked to my identity and that of my family as working class immigrants of color. So a couple of projects I'll show you guys um, is 
yeah, I'll just jump into this. So with a degree in ethnic studies and with a concentration on immigration policy, I use art as my tool to oftentimes think through civic engagement and what that means for disenfranchised communities. So for example, one of my projects, the official unofficial voting station, voting for all who legally can't, creates symbolic voting opportunities for the 92 million plus million people who can't legally vote in the United States during the general elections. And for this project, the Purchase Banner Lending Library, which I started in 2016, I started this project from thinking through how protests are oftentimes not safe or accessible for certain communities, certain vulnerable communities. For example, many who are non-citizens or undocumented people fear getting arrested at protests, which could greatly compromise them being here and staying here. So since 2016, I've been um, creating these workshops that are free and public, right? Protest Manor and making workshops and uh, I also run these physical lending libraries of donated purchase banners. So the workshop skill sharing component has become importantly pedagogical. The workshops and the space they create address people's immediate desires to create banners for themselves and others to use in protest. It also places the skill of making purchase banners in the hands of participants. Um, so teaching people how to make them is very important for this project. Obviously, when we're thinking about revolution, it doesn't end with one banner, it needs to continue, right? And so these workshops have become such an important part of my practice because it is where I feel nourished. It's important to me that, um, it's also important to me because in many non-Euro Western cultures, art is made collectively and not by an individual. So making art together creates spaces for our knowledge connected through lived experiences to be shared and uplifted. So there's more than 3000 banners that have been made in workshops um, and their purchase banner lending libraries in cities all over the United States and internationally as well. And it is an active ongoing project where banners are constantly being made, circulated, being checked out, used and returned. The words of these banners have a growing history. They're made by someone, they're used in a protest, returned to the library, and then so taken by someone else to a different protest. The banners carries the histories of the hands that's made them, hold them, and the places where they have traveled. So actually, one second, I believe I might have not shared the sound for this. There we go, awesome, just wanted to make sure. Okay, so from that project, um, the Purchase Banner Lending Library came a more recent project called the Purchase Garment Lab, which I'm really excited to share with you guys today. So I'm gonna show a couple videos um, and I'll stop them kind of short just so um, I don't run too long on time. So from um, the Protest Banner Lending Library, I had a lot of uh, conversations with people that checked out the banners talking about safety, right? Safety, traveling to protests, like, you know, one of the benefits of having fabric banners was that people could fold it up and hide it sort of nicely. And these moments that people would talk about where they would uh, open it up and that being this really transformative moment. And so I kept thinking through that more and thinking about garments um, and how we could create um, these garments that have hidden appendages or pockets that can open up and become protest banners. So um, I've been working with other artists and makers to create these garments and depending on you know the concerns of me and my collaborators, um, they take many different, um, you know, it, it comes out very differently, right? So here 
Uh, the previous one was by Miranda Betancourt, who is a Puerto Rican, right? So she, her slogan is Ni Una Menos Ni Una Mas, fighting against the femicides that's happening in Puerto Rico and Latin America. And then here, Andrea Ramirez, um, she wanted to create these garments that she was looking a lot into the history of like Cholo, Pachuco fashion uh, that are deemed delinquent and sort of taking that on. And her, she's from Mexico uh, City, her family is. And she was talking about how uh, her family would dance cumbia in the street um, as a sort of celebration and protest. And so creating these garments that are meant to be activated by dancing cumbia in the streets. And these lyrics are taken by, or these uh, slogans are from cumbia lyrics themselves. This is Eric Guy. Um, this, I wish I could had time to show the video, but it's, um, these are actually, you know, when you turn your pockets inside out, so these are his pockets, they just are ridiculous pockets that go beyond his feet. And so he, in, you know, he goes and, and puts his hands in his pockets and then empties it and thinking about the gesture of like emptying out your pockets and then, you know, the statement of capitalism sucks comes out. <laughs> and um, yeah, and so really this body of work is being made to protect the wearer of the garment, to highlight this moment of transformation and to embolden the wearer of the garment. So for this body of work, I have so far uh, worked with multiple other artists to create more than 16 garments since this ongoing project. So I'm gonna show a little bit of this video because um, I'm afraid I don't have too much time, but um, here we go. I'll stop it right there for the sake of time. But yeah, I'm a part of this women only uh, Korean traditional drumming group. And we are all activists and organizers uh, fighting to end gender-based violence for economic justice, fighting for immigrant justice. So uh, we oftentimes also drum at protests. And so I wanted to create garments that we can activate while drumming. So. I was excited to share that with you. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness, Aram, that was amazing. Um, you're getting a lot of love in the comments, uh, in the chat. Um, you know, love that. That's so dope. It's beautiful. It's amazing. Genius, um, especially for spaces where protest signs are not allowed inside, right? This is so creative and innovative and cool and I love the thought of activating garments for protests, said Lisa. So thank you so much for sharing. And um, Lisa Wolfork, I'd like to invite you now to share a little bit about your journey. Hello, everybody. And thank you so much again to the University of Illinois Chicago Women's Leadership and Resource Center. Thank you so much. Uh, Ramona for being such an amazing host and convener. And also thank you so much, Aram. This is, this is a real delight and honor for me uh, to sit down with you to be able to ask questions about activating garments. I've been thinking a bit about garmature as a form of, of history and meaning making. And so this is 
absolutely perfect. And I love the one about the pockets because when I make my um, spouse or kids clothes and when I would make their pockets, I always had something funny and ironic in it. So like one time I made their pockets and it had like a bunch of money on the fabric for the pocket. So they always had money in their pockets. And also because I have two boys um, who are, uh, so as far as I can tell, cisgender. What, anyway, they love to joke about nuts. And so I made their pants pockets out of fabric with nuts that I'd found this nuts fabric. And so like they could put their hands in their pockets and they could touch their nuts. You know what I mean? It was, it was a thing. It was, it was a thing. I, the, yeah, nut joke, nuts, farts, you know, lots of very high level conversation happening here at this home. Um, and so I'm so glad to be here. My name is Lisa Wolf. Fork. I am the founder slash convener of Black Women's Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. And I say convener uh, based actually on the Church of Black Feminist Thought, uh, which was a radical study group, I think that might have come out of um, Berkeley as well. And they talk about convening and pulling people together. And that is what Black Women's Stitch is dedicated to doing. I am not trying to be representative of all Black women in sewing. I want to be a resource and I want to be someone who pulls us together and celebrates, uplifts, and talks about our varied and very rich stitching history and traditions. And so Black Women's Stitch started not just, it's, it started as a project in 2018. Um, it's so it's a rather it's rather new, but also incredibly heartfelt. I am a fourth generation, so as my mother sewed, my grandmother sewed, my grandmother's mother sewed, and when I was a kid, I wanted nothing to do with it. I was not interested. I was terrible. I was like, why do we have to have made clothes when we could buy them at the mall? You know, just you know, kids, horrible. Um, but. I started to realize once I was in graduate school about what it meant to self-sustain and what it meant to have a, um, a hobby or a craft practice, an art practice that could be self-sustaining, self-reproducing, self-reflective, where that you could make things that you could wear on your body um, as a way to just fortify aspects and elements of your life. It was a wonderful um, hobby. It was um, therapeutic, not therapy. I know there's people that say sewing is my therapy. Therapy is my therapy. Sewing is sewing. Um, it has lots of therapeutic elements, um, but it's not, it's not, in my opinion, substitute for a trained professional. Um, but one of the things that has been so exciting about the project is that I have been incredibly vigilant about centering, uplifting, noticing, and just praising Black women in this sewing tradition. And so I wanted to share just a very short video. Um, it's, it's just like one minute, a one minute long reel about Black Women's Stitch that Virginia Public Media uh, recently did as a kind of a compilation of some of the stuff that I'd already done because it kind of gives a nice overview. And then I'll talk a bit about where the organization idea comes from and about the podcast and other aspects that we've been doing um, in the last you know, few years since we've been around. So I'm gonna share my screen. I believe my sound is shared. Um, and we will, yep, share sound. And I'll even say optimize for a video clip. And this should be good to share. Is this something, can everyone see okay? Um, I see some nods, okay. And then we'll hit play. Black Women's Stitch is the sewing yeah. group where Black lives matter. It's an opportunity for Black women who sew, quilt, stitch, or otherwise engage in needle arts to come together in an environment that allows us to be our whole and full selves. If we imagine our lives being full and total and free, it becomes really important that we're able to engage in leisure, recreational activities that are meaningful. And so when we start to look back at the stitching traditions of Black women, you can find quilts going back to the 1800s and sometimes even the late 1700s. It's nice to know that what I'm participating in is the same craft that my grandmother did, 
and that her mother did. And so it's really nice to know that we are all part of, as what Jim Hewitt says, this long thread. Thank you. So what what the video kind of reflects a bit is some of the some of the why of Black Women's Ditch. That I know that there are some that wonder, like, well, why do you need a sewing group where Black Lives Matter? And my answer is, have you ever sewn with white people in large groups? Um, I have, and it is not as fun as it could be. Um, and specifically. For about two decades, I started sewing like very actively when I was in graduate school. I went to, I was actually a neighbor of Illinois. I went to the University of Wisconsin at Madison where I got my PhD and where I started my sewing practice. And I apprenticed with a quilter, a white quilter and she was nice and I learned a lot. I took a lot of classes. I got very into it and I got accustomed because of where I was in the Midwest of being the only black person in the quilt guild, the only black person at a particular retreat or an event, um, and often the youngest person. And that continued all the way until I started um, here in Charlottesville and as, and as a professor. And it just was a very Anglo, very white, um, and um, higher in age demographic. And, and it, was, it was fine. It was fine. It wasn't ideal. It wasn't great. It wasn't people that I would consider like that I would be friends, friends with, but just acquaintances. And it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't harmful until it became harmful. And what it, that, what that took was white supremacists being very angry that their racist civil war participation trophies in the form of Robert E. Lee and Confederate statues that have dominated the public landscape in Charlottesville, Virginia since the 1920s, that these things were in danger of being removed. When we started to talk about and demand that the statues come down because they were racist and they were created and erected to create and claim white space, um, there's lots of, you know, historical undercover, undercovering that has revealed all of this, um, that this was, this then became the site of the largest white supremacist rally in, to date, um, to up to, up until 2017. Um, and so in what folks, what many folks don't know is that we had an entire summer of white supremacist rallies. We had a little short one in May, which was the first fire rally um, that took place in the public park where Lee, where the Lee statue was situated right across from the public library where I would take my kids. Um, and then in June, there was another smaller rally. In July, the Klan came um, from North Carolina because they were mad about taking down a racist statue. And then in August, that was the, the large rally with public brawls in the street and ultimately um, a car terror attack that resulted in the murder of one protester, Heather Heyer, and the injury to dozens of people. Um, my spouse and I were standing about less than a hundred yards, very, very close to the site of that crash. And it was an utter nightmare. It was chaos. It was chaos. I, you know, you didn't know what was happening. It was, it was really traumatizing. We woke up screaming for weeks. It was terrible. And so I made the very unwise decision um, that very September, so the terror attack is in August, I'm like working on the media collective stuff. I'm interviewing, I'm arranging interviews, I'm writing, I'm you know doing things just to talk about how terrible this is. There's lots of people who are very shocked. Oh, how could this happen? How could this happen in Charlottesville? And it's like, oh, you forget Charlottesville is America. Um, and so I decided to take a break by going to a quilt retreat in a city that wasn't in Charlottesville. It was like a little small town, maybe an hour away. And again, I had been stitching with these women for about 15 years. Um, they had, they when my father passed away suddenly, they made me a quilt. Uh, when my baby was born, they um, sent cards, you know, those kinds of things. And when, but when I went there, 
as a member of Black Lives Matter, as someone who had recently survived a terror attack, um, they were not, they were, I can't think what they were. They were disturbed. They were, some were concerned. Oh, I heard that you were there. What was that like? I was like, oh, it, it was, it was awful. You know, I don't, I don't really want to talk about it. Um, and then the organizer of that event made an announcement, not in my hearing, that Charlottesville was not to be discussed. It was not to be discussed or mentioned at all. This was not for my benefit. This was for their comfort. Later on, when I got home after the event, you know, I you know, survived and went home and, you know, I finished my quilt projects, everything was fine. But when I got home a few days later, a, an envelope with my name and address and nothing else in it, but my check for the future event. There was another event that I'd already paid for prior to all of this. And that check was returned to me, which was a clear signal that I was unwanted at the next convening of this group. Silly me thinks, oh no, something has happened. Maybe the event has been canceled. Let me check. So I call someone that I was friendly with and I asked about it. And she was like, no, I don't think the event's been canceled. And I was like, well, I'm clearly not welcome. This is why my check is in my hand and not at the bank. Um, and she said, well, I don't think that this person is prejudiced. The only thing I could think of is that you broke the rule and talked about Charlottesville. That's the only thing I could think that you might've done wrong. And I was just like, after that, it was done. I, I, was, in, I was so sad because I really enjoyed the time. I enjoyed that. Um, I enjoyed just going to sit and stitch right? I, I blocked out a lot of things. I blocked out a lot of microaggressions. I blocked out a lot of comments and questions that were completely inappropriate. Um, I would have conversations with women who were my mother's age about what racism was. And I'm like, why am I talking to this complete white adult who lived in the same South as my mother lived in and doesn't know what racism is? I will not. And so it became important to me Yes, it became important to me to have a conversation and to recalibrate everything. And so I recalibrated it in the love of Black women and in centering our stories and in essentially in building what I needed. I was able to convene not just um, uh, an organization basis, but also a podcast that has reached up till now about 300,000 downloads, um, 115 episodes. And every week we are talking and celebrating and uplifting creativity, projects, sewing, quilting, and through the lens of Black women. So that's what that's my intro. I don't want to go over too long. I know we have um, a limited time to talk. And so I'm happy to answer more questions if there are any available. I can also talk about the course that I'm teaching that brings in some of these same ideas. Um, so that's me. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, and there are a couple of comments in the chat. Uh, what a beautiful remaking from an ugly episode. Um, oh, Lisa, I've never heard, I'd never heard the story of, of that retreat and the return check. I'm so sorry. Um, and I agree. And some love for your podcast. Um, so, oh my gosh. Okay. So I want you all to know that Lisa and Aram and I talked the other day and it was meant to be a prep call for this session. And it turned into an entire conversation between the two of them. I had to do nothing because these two have so much to talk about. They're so excited to learn more about each other and share more about what they're doing. So even though I have questions, I'm going to ask you both before I even ask anything. Do you already have something that you want to talk about? Because I know I want to hear a little bit more about how you did end up finding your community and who your people are and how you bring people into the work. Um, because I feel like that's a little bit of a natural progression from what you've just both been talking about. Um, but also, I know that you're really excited to talk with each other, and this is a dialogue. So I open the floor to both of you to have at it. 
I want to I want to throw a great question. Well, this is a great question, but a question I'm so excited with for Aram. I really appreciate the way that you have imagined communal art practice and put that together as a form of pedagogy. I think that is incredibly powerful. And it is such a great reminder too, that what white supremacist patriarchal capitalism wants is us to work in isolation, right? That we're meant to just be one person who has to struggle really hard to figure out how to fix things and then you don't get anywhere. But if we remind ourselves that really community should be the default, right? Um, and like, you know, the we keep each other safe type idea. I wonder if you could talk a bit about a bit more about that. And like, what some of the what some of the things that you've discovered and how you might have deepened that particular part of the process that that collective, let's sit down with, you know, some, you know, some yarn markers, iron thread, whatever, to make this thing. I, I really love that. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, yeah, I do feel like we have so much to talk about. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm excited. Um, yeah, the communal part of uh, my practice, which is essentially most of it, um, it's so important to me in so many ways. Like you said, because that's, that I think is so central to fighting the oppressive powers, right? Um, and so for me, with all these projects where I have multiple collaborators, I see it as coalition building, right? So like, how do we come together? And, you know, and I think also importantly, like when we talk about the workshops and we talk about making together, in a lot of ways, it isn't always, um, we don't always agree. And I think that's also really important to recognize and to state because, it's like, we don't always agree, but we can come together and, and with the purchase banners, like support each other to make the purchase banners, even if maybe it's not a statement I really agree with or love, right? But that we can a support each other and make through and make art together, I think is so important. And it's really nice in the workshops um, where we do sort of have disagreements, right? Because, you know, I, I feel pretty safe um, in all the workshops and, and the making actually is really nice sort of buffer, right? So it's like, we can sort of connect on making together. And then I could gently ask like, hey, can you tell me about why you chose this slogan or where you're going to use it? And it becomes these really beautiful moments, actually. Like there was a person that came to a workshop, an older um, white uh, woman and she was making a purchase banner about like uh abortion you are you wanting an abortion like there are other options right because mm. i was like mm, i don't love that but then as i was talking to her she uh, volunteers at a community um, center that provides resources for uh, low-income mothers and so she wanted to put it up there and talking to her there I was like wow you're doing such important work right like I don't necessarily agree with this banner still but like we can come together and see each other's humanity which is what you know white supremacy capitalism doesn't want us to do right, that's right. so yeah I think that's why you know my work my work is so workshop based and I'm I'm forever gonna work with a thousand collaborators because I mean number one is the funnest right because and I always make things that I would never make by myself right and I love that and then like I said yeah the sort of coalition building like we can we need to come together mm -hmm. and I love that about the idea of the coalition because you can have and I think this idea of understanding at least something I think is important is that a lot of oppression is interlinked and that it becomes important that we can stand up for each other, even if this cause is not necessarily primary to me, but it's primary to you or it's primary to another maker. And so that does make us all stronger when we can put like light hand, many, you know, many hands make light work. You know, this idea that and I love your phrase of to make through, 
Like, you know, we talk about making a way through, but mm-hmm. it's the making itself that is the thing that helps to kind of move the needle of conversation that helps to like in that process, I think there's something really powerful. And I think you might agree with this about kinetic learning, right? That when you do something, there is something that opens up certain pathways of thought of like just resituating like really quick reframes that can happen when you have a paintbrush in your hand, when you've got a calligraphy pen in your hand, when you've got any kind of implement that you are able to do and make something with and to make something through. I think that's really very powerful. And that kind of collective idea that collaborators need not share like in terms of the the, the granular level of things that they might agree on, but at least at the broader level that there are certain things here that are broken that we can work to repair together. Um, and I think that's really amazing. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I want I, I would love to go back to a conversation we had for our pre-check, um, <laughs> for our prep call, which was you were talking about the needle as this tool, right? Mm-hmm. Um, to fight against uh, white supremacy. So I, I would love for you to talk about that again, because I, I just felt like that was so important to share. I'm so excited about that. And I am working through that, y'all. We were talking about Audre Lorde's essay, which was a, a talk that she gave at a women's, a women's conference. And the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. That was her claim. And what she was really addressing in there was that basically um, a lot of, a bunch of white feminists had gotten together to have this conference. Um, There were like no black speakers. They found her at the last minute. Um, And so she kind of talked about like, hey, if we're gonna be in these institutions, we we shouldn't reproduce the same tools that we are fighting against. Like the goal isn't to become like, you know, to have more women billionaires. The goal isn't to have more, you know, be saved through black capitalism, right? And so I started, we were in a class and I started thinking, we talk about master's tools, master's tools, master's tools. And our very first activity in the class actually was to study a calligraphy nib. And a calligraphy nib, which we think of as fancy high style writing now, was just how they wrote back in the 18th and 19th century. And so the, the, the calligraphy nib has a vent. And there was something about that vent, something about the idea that a nib could breathe, that it requires pressure to release its ink. And, and the gesture where you drag your the, the point through the ink that has been breathed out. So we spent a lot of time talking about that. And we talked about how through the stroke of a pen, people's lives were completely destroyed. Um, not just through treaties that were written and broken, but also through um, the violent grammar of repetition, the ditto mark. Right when you look at a ledger of enslaved people, it will be this long list. It'll just be ditto, 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 ditto. That that person's human value had been recorded in an accounting ledger as just two quick lines. And so we start. I started to think about well, notwithstanding the fact that there is somebody somewhere out there, you know, hand sewing Nazi flags and Klan robes. What if we were to think about the needle and thread? as something that was not a master's tool? Mm -hmm. What if we were to think about this idea of stitching, of of what it means to put needle and thread to fabric as a way to dismantle some aspect, some element of this system that seems so total? Mm -hmm. And it feels like when I look at your banners, when I look at the the person turning their pockets inside out and saying capitalism sucks, right, that this seems like an illustration of how stitching can be used as an alternative, not just as building kinetic knowledge for liberation or thought practices that exceed the boundaries of capitalism, but also for creating particular material resources that can be used to indict that struggle. 
So that was where I was heading with that. And I was just, I'm just really, I'm still playing with this idea, but it connects to a larger theory I'm working on, which is called forecrafting, like forecasting, but it's forecrafting. And this is based on some of my work with Sally Hemings University as an idea of what happens when you have a black woman, you have a marginalized woman who is able to imagine freedom for her descendants and future possibilities for her descendants that she herself will never enjoy. So if for those who don't know the story, Sally Hemings was an enslaved girl um, who was uh, a sexual um, concubine raped by Thomas Jefferson. They had about five or six kids. Their relationship began when she was 14 years old. And when she was in France, she was free. She was a pregnant, a pregnant teenager in France and she doesn't wanna go back. And Jefferson has to lure her back to Monticello. Um, and part of that bargain, and her son says that they struck, um, that, that, that Hemings was able to negotiate, negotiate extraordinary privileges which meant that any children that she and Jefferson had would be freed when they reached maturity. And that's a promise Jeff Jefferson kept. Now, Hemings was never freed, but the children were. And this, and I, and I was, I, I started pulling on this thread, <laughs> upon, I started pulling on this thread when I looked back at the Old Testament in the, um, in the Christian Bible, looking at Moses and his mother, that Joshua Ben, his mother had to send him away, to send Moses away to build that, what's even called now a Moses basket. She, we she weaved this basket for him because she knew that getting rid of her baby, pushing him away from her was the surest path to saving his life. Hmm. And so, and I think also about, um, I think Ashley Sack, the, I think the book by, I think it's Tanisha, For I'm trying, I'm think, I can't think of the historian right now, but it's called Ashley Sack, um, this book. And it talks about this enslaved woman who was being sold away from her daughter. And she took a flower sack and wrote and stitched her name on it. You know, here is, this is, this has my, all my love for you. Take this and take it with you. And that there's a, there's a beautiful story. I think, that, I think it won the National Book Award last year, the story of that sack, which is currently in on permanent loan from the plantation at which it originated um, for, uh, at the National Museum of African-American um, History and Culture right now in DC. So that, that we have evidence of that. So um, I'm not sure if that's really like an answer, but I would, but that's what I'm thinking through. I'm thinking mm -hmm. through the idea that these women uh, were able to create, yeah, thank you so much. I uh, thank you so much. Tia Miles um, was able to document and we can look and see that despite all the master's tools, that bag is still there. Those mm -hmm. stitches are still there. Sally Hemings' children were freed. You know, and so there's something about that. There's something about that needle. There's something about that thread. There's something about that that I find maybe if we could even call it what Harriet Jacobs describes in her memoir or her slave narrative, um, a loophole of retreat. Mm -hmm. Like, how do we duck? You know, like, how do we like navigate through this such encroaching and powerful system? you know, and that there are, these, there are these little moments of possibility. And that was what I was thinking of when I was thinking about stitching as an alternative to master's tools. Yeah, that's so beautiful and so powerful. Yeah, and I, and I just, I keep thinking about, yeah, like how powerful sewing is and how to verbalize that, right? And so, yeah, I think there's something to, so powerful about the ways that you're talking about it. And it resonates for me too, because, you know, yeah, coming to the United States, my mom having that skill of knowing how to sew and that being sort of an economic, you know, access point for her, right? And so, um, you know, interestingly, my mom was an artist and art educator in Korea, but when coming here, um, and she's a painter, being unable to 
um, do that, but being able to, you know, sew to make a living for the yeah. family. And um, it's, yeah, it's interesting too, because my mom, you know, has sewed for like 27 years at their dry cleaning store. And when I told her that this was my art practice, she actually cried and was like, I sew all day long so that you don't have to do this. Yes. Right. And so like thinking about that resonates for me in that way as well. Right. Yes. It's like, yeah, um, it's such a powerful tool in so many ways that I think, yeah. I, I love that because that's that was one of the things I was going to ask you. I feel that sometimes when we, I love the work that you're doing with garmature. I love this idea. I think it is so radically powerful. And I also recognize what your mother is describing because I'm not sure if you've run into this. If we talk to fashion folks, if we talk to designers, if we talk to or about that, or even the higher, the higher up you go in the chain of fashion or haute couture, when it comes down to the sewing, mm -hmm. it feels as though we and that particular labor gets reduced to mm -hmm. as if it were nothing, mm -hmm. right? The, the designers are the ones with the vision. The okay. designers are the ones who can draw and create. And it just takes somebody to put needle to thread and thread to fabric. Big deal. Anybody can do that. This idea that sewing is somehow unskilled raw material labor is the same action in my mind when they would call, when they would call field, field, field workers or farm workers, when they would call them hands. Mm -hmm. It's like this kind of schenectady, right? That, mm -hmm. that if you are picking fruit, if you are picking cotton, if you are harvesting rice, these are just, they're unskilled, all you need is a warm body and functioning limbs and anybody can do it. And it seems to me that that same type of dismissal is violent mm -hmm. and only benefits those who want to amass capital around the skill, but don't have it themselves. Mm -hmm. And this idea that somehow sewing something I know it just feels like that dismissiveness, this idea that it matters not at all, right? That it's it's just or it's just a hobby. It's just a it's just a thing. It's, it's the same thing with like if anything that women do, if women do it, therefore it it automatically has less value. And I was wondering like how you like would respond to some of those critiques because I, I find it very frustrating to talk about design or to talk about fashion or to talk about you know the, the structure of these amazing and wonderful garments. Um, this kind of, I don't know, the idea that somehow the sewing of it itself is, is minimal um, as if somehow, I don't know, there's something about that that I just always find really off-putting. You know what I'm saying? I don't know, that, I don't know if you've yeah. ever run into that. Yeah, all the time, for sure. In many different ways, you know, like you're saying, you know, it, it gets, um, you, first of all, no one knows how long sewing takes, right? <laughs> Even us sewers, like, I'm like, I, I'm going to, it's going to take me this amount of time. And I laugh because I still am like off by so much. I underestimate so vastly, right? Because it takes so much time and so much skill, like you're saying, to be able to do that. And yeah, I think I see it in many different ways in the, you know, in the fine art worlds, right? Like, um, you know, sometimes I, I vent to my people that are close to me that I feel like sometimes I get punished for making my own work, right? Because like institutions are like, you need to crank this out now with this kind of budget. And it's like, no, I, I, we can pay someone to produce it and maybe it could work that way, but they are never willing to pay for like the time that it makes me, takes me to, to sew and produce my own work. Right. And so that I vent about, you know, and yeah, like you're saying as well, like you, the words that we use around sewing is so violent, you know, the unskilled labor or like invisible labor, right? I'm like, who is it invisible to, <laughs> right? Who is it invisible so, to? <laughs> you know, it's like, you have to actively not see it and then it will be invisible. But yes. yeah, and yeah, like you're saying too, like, you know, these, these, 
the designer, the artist, like, um, and all the people that they're hiring don't get acknowledged and like who are actually doing the work and the sewing work don't get acknowledged or they're unnamed. And I do feel like it becomes really violent in so many ways. Yeah, I think this, yeah, it's interesting that like, it's, yeah, it, I mean, it's not interesting because like throughout history, it's been exploited, like sewing practices and textiles have been exploited and it's, and it's such a violent history, you know? And so it also surprises me with the story that, I mean, it doesn't surprise me, but, you know, with the story that you're telling of, of, you know, how people push really hard to try to make sewing not political, but don't recognize that by doing that, it that's very political, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, stop harshing my hobby. I don't want to have to think about, you know, where this was made, or I don't want to think about, um, you know, politics, keep your politics out of my quilt or whatever. I mean, I mean, the idea that you can think about somebody's racial identity as a political issue mm -hmm. is from is the perspective of a, of a person who has never had to think about their racial identity as compromising anything about their life. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and I think that this age in which we currently live, this really aggressive avoidance of racial accountability for white people. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, where I'm living right now in Virginia, we just, um, the governor just passed a law about divisive concepts and divisive pretty much means anything that makes white people uneasy. Right. You know, and like they are banning books and a hotline to report teachers. If you hear a teacher talking about race, therefore you can go report them because one thing we can never teach in Virginia is the 1619 project, which started in Virginia, right? Like, I mean, it's just, it's appalling. It's absolutely appalling. And, and I think I see this as like the death throes of these people, you know, this is like, you know, their last gasp and grab, you know, for completely rewriting American history. Um, but the truth is out, you know, mm -hmm. and it's very hard to put the truth back in once it, once it's been out. Uh, and so, I, I just I just feel as though it can be difficult to acknowledge that that you've harmed someone, maybe. I mean, I don't know. I actually honestly, I don't spend much my much my, much of my time thinking about those people. Um, but because you know, I've got like way better options now. But this idea that what we are doing is somehow um taking things too far. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I think that that is the thing. It's like, I want to take it all the way. I want to take it all the way until we got all the freedom, all the liberation, and we don't have to talk about it anymore. I think that anybody who has ever made a protest banner, anybody who has ever created a slogan for an organization, anybody who's tried to work up some really catchy and memorable chants and songs would like to not have to do that. Mm -hmm. right if the world was habitable and livable we would not have to do these things mm -hmm. and we but we do them to create space for that type of habitability that's why we do it you know we mm -hmm. do it to show that there is a distance between where america says it is and what america says it does between its promises and its practices yeah, I mean, it's interesting, even listening to the words that you're using, right, because it's like this avoidance of politics becomes, you know, the defense becomes about white people's comfort. And I think about that word a lot and in the violence of that word. I yeah. mean, in particular, also, I'm like closely working with, you know, organizers and activists around comfort women justice, right, where, you know, more than 200,000 um, women all over Asia and beyond were forced into sexual slavery by Japanese imperialism, yes. right? So like, and that has no, hasn't really been acknowledged. There is no justice. And so, yeah, it, that word has become so it, it viscerally, whenever I hear the word comfort, it really like 
I feel it. It, 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 it hurts, you know? And, and yeah, it's like the avoidance of politics becomes about, no, we need to be comfortable without the recognition of who we are. And then, like you said, but then the folks who are marginalized in some sort of way are really fighting for habitability, Mm -hmm. you know? So the difference between like comfort and habitability is just so great, isn't it? (laughs) And the idea that white discomfort is actionable, Mm -hmm. right? We talk a lot about how like feelings aren't facts, feelings aren't facts, feelings aren't facts until they are. And what we have stumbled into, I believe at this stage is that the feelings of white people are now facts that have to be acknowledged and corrected. Mm -hmm. I don't know how long they can continue in this way. I mean, it's, it's not, I, I, I find it boggling. I absolutely find it boggling um, that one would in this country pass books to ban books about, you know, people who are wanting to ban mouse. Mouse, how do you want people to learn about the Holocaust? Oh, wait, I forgot. You don't want them to learn about that, you know? And I've noticed this for quite some time when you have the right co-opting language and practices from the left, right? Um, Diversity, equity, and inclusion Mm -hmm. as language that the right uses in order to ban books, to Mm -hmm. make sure that all students feel safe. I don't know how you legislate that. I can tell you, I felt quite unsafe in algebra because I'm terrible at math. And no one was passing any laws to keep math out of school, you know? I mean, I haven't thought about it since, but I do think that it, this, this reinforcement of both saying that America is not a racist country, that America never had any inequity, that the founding of America is based on purity and equity and opportunity, and that is what America has done always from its very beginning points, even when the historical record says otherwise, even when the laws on our own books says otherwise, that that is the new story. And that if anyone says that America is a racist country, so, and I find it, I, I do think that they have run a very successful campaign because they have completely changed the terms of the conversation. And so now it becomes a debate about is America a racist country? The answer is clearly yes, but that's mm-hmm. only, the answer is no, only if you think about racism as a slur at, rather than a description. Mm-hmm. I mean, how do you, it just, it's, it's improbable to me mm-hmm. to not say that this country is racist. I, That's and there are people true. who don't believe that slavery <laughs> was racist. Like, is slavery racist? Well, no, slavery wasn't racist. It was an economic system. What? Yeah. What are you talking about? How's that an answer? Yeah, that is. I do feel like this sort of defensiveness and, you know, reinforcing of white supremacy happens a lot in sewing uh, communities, particularly, you know, in the United States and, and Europe, right? And so, yeah, I, I, you know, hearing your story, it's, I feel some, I have definitely a lot of similar stories I could share, but I do feel like they're, they're oftentimes very hostile spaces for me. And yes, you know, and I think, you know, even, you know, we were talking in the prep call about, you know, this being people's hobbies and, um, and certain artists saying like they sew and then the sewing becomes a conversation or like, I, it, this took me a long time to make. So this work is about labor and then being like, no, actually that's about leisure because like, yes. when we look at, like what my mom does that's sewing for labor so how is it so disconnected or like you know sewing being and quilting being looked at as women's work but we never talk about which women are we talking about and which histories are we really holding on to and romanticizing right this like 
really Victorian, like old school, like white women at home sewing for their families and like, you know, that being the narrative. And it's just like, how far do we have to go back? And like, why are we being so blind to like, who's actually doing this work at this very moment, right? Absolutely. And I think that the, the, the project, Who Sews Your Clothes, I think is absolutely getting at that. I think that, and I'm not sure if it's part of Fashion Revolution. I'm not sure who the, the, um, the curator of that project is, but what they do is they talk about fast fashion and how dangerous it is, how harmful it is, the human cost of it, as well as the environmental cost of it. You know, and the idea of who made your clothes is something that is absolutely worth um, worth thinking about, right? Because what we do is we all, we think about this all the time, and the idea that some people get to have this as their hobby, their leisure, just for fun, and that other people are doing this you know, under really harmful conditions, um, with limited resources, with not as a form of their own personal creative expression. I think that these two ideas often work in tandem. Mm -hmm. um, and that the folks who are kind of like dismissing or to push away or are completely ignoring that everything in this country is political loaded in some way. There are no clean neutral spaces that politics or the discomforts that come from living in a white supremacist patriarchal capitalist society. It shows up everywhere, everywhere, even on our most, at the doctor's office, at the, at the temple, synagogue, church, wherever you go, those things are there. And it takes deliberate effort to notice them and to mitigate their harms or to step completely outside them and not engage at all, which is something I'm trying to do. Yeah, that's that's hard to do. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> that's why you have to do it with a group. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Or create your own group. But yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think um do we have any um questions from folks here from the audience? Thank yeah, you all so much for being here and for your amazing comments too. Yeah, thank you so much. I've been reading them as often as I can. And it's been really great to see. We have kind of a small group here right now. So if anybody would like to come off mute and ask a question, please, please feel free. I think, I mean, I, I can speak for myself only, but I'm imagining that everybody is experiencing this similarly to the way that I am, which is just sitting back and enjoying the conversation and really just wanting to know <laughs> what you have to say next. Um, but please, if there is anybody, um, otherwise, you know, please feel free to continue chatting. Well, I am Lisa Rice from Washington, D.C., and I'm a fangirl of Lisa Wolfor. Hey, Lisa! Um, hi, sweetie. Um, I wrote in the comments, and I don't know if Aram was able to see it, but um, I, I did not know, Aram, that you are Korean, and so I did not know what the conversation would be like. And I have been immersed in Korean culture um, since second grade and I'm a Taekwondo instructor and my son is a third Dan. This is very much part of us. And to have the two of you here, like I'm starting to tear up because, because so often we can't, you know, we can't appreciate both cultures. And if you're pro-Black, you have to be anti-Asian. And if you're pro-Asian, you have to be anti-Black. And that's not the way I lived. It's not the way I raised my son. And so I just want to say, coming here today when I was expecting, I don't know what I was expecting, but I just came because Lisa makes me do stuff. Um, <laughs> I just posted it. I know. Glad you're here. <laughs> I know, but it, 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 I just, I just want the two of you to know that this has, it's been incredible for me and oh my God, the protest garments, watch out. 
Watch yes. the F out. <laughs> I'm already thinking about dresses that need pockets that go beyond the floor. Uh-huh. <laughs> like some really nice baggy cargo pants. Like you could do a lot. You put the little bendy things in one of the outside snap pockets. Like there's all sorts of stuff. Yes. And yeah, I love that. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to respond real quick and let Aram respond to. I don't believe that we are served by having our proneness being attached to anti, you know, Mm -hmm. that there is no need for this kind of, you know, like you can be black loving, black affirming, black, you know, and not feel like, and, and that's not taking away anything from anybody, you know, that your ability to love someone, to love and support and cherish does not require you to hate anybody. Like there's no, there's no benefit to that. And I find, I find that that kind of divisiveness really is, who does that serve? It does not serve anybody, you know? Yeah, it doesn't serve anyone. And, and, you know, when you're home, when you're raised, you know, when I'm raised in a way, I am black. And as I said, immersed in Korean culture since second grade, immersed my son in it since he was four years old within our home within our spaces that is part of who we are. It's just this outside world, you know, and you were talking about yeah. how supremacist culture wants us to devote that energy uh, to <laughs> fighting all that crap on the outside so that we can't flourish. So right. I just love you both. Lisa, you know, I love you. Aram, you're lucky I don't know your address because I'd start sending you love notes. So. <laughs> Thank you both. I'll message it to you. (laughs) I love love notes. Yeah, I mean, that is like, yeah, thank you so much for sharing. And I love hearing that. I can imagine some protest garments that you can activate during Taekwondo. That'd be so cool. My child is six and currently in orange belt. So, (laughs) but yeah, I think definitely it's been, you know, yeah, our communities, right? Like it white supremacy right has like pitted us against each other and yeah. you know I I think about um I really love that book Intimacies of Four Continents by Lisa Lowe mm-hmm. and she like in the financial records like finds these letters that literally are like oh shit slavery we can't it's no longer feasible for us what should we do and it's like let's bring in cheap labor from China and then there's like a letter that's like oh they're too friendly with each other we need to separate them what do we do right and so like like there's evidence of this right that like so much evidence actually I don't even have to say that but like (laughs) that, that yeah white supremacy has like forced us to fight amongst each other like you said but really like and I think I'm really excited by some of the conversations happening recently in the last, you know, four years, five years that, you know, really within the Asian American community, that's like, oh shoot, what have you been doing? Like, there's so many black, like anti-blackness within our community that we need to address and, and remedy, you know, and we're, I think a lot of, you know, the folks at least that I'm pretty close to, we've been working really hard on that. And I think that's, that's something that I have hope for. Yeah, that's beautiful. Ramona, I don't know if you have a roundup for us. I'm so sorry, y'all. I have to go. It, it, I have another oh. thing, another meeting at 2.15, uh, which is 1.15, your time. Um, did you have a closing for us or something you want us to think about for next time? You know, I, <laughs> it's so She's funny like, I know, that you I, you know, I'm just sitting in the background listening to y'all and, and there are a million more things that I want to ask you um, and that I'm sure other folks want to as well. Um, but I think I'm just going to wrap it up because um, uh, I'm, I'm really still processing everything that you've talked about. Um, and, and I just, you know, I really want to share my appreciation and, I, you know, the appreci- you have so much appreciation coming through in the comments and you have all throughout the program. Um, this has just been really lovely. Um, and it's, it's given me a lot of, a lot to think about, um, in my own creative practice, which isn't nearly as active as yours. Um, but also in the ways that I honor my mother and my ancestors, right. In this, because that's where I learned all of my, 
own creative skills. My, well, at least when it comes to textiles and fiber arts, um, not that I'm an expert by any means, but um, you know, it's, it's um, yeah. I mean, around when you were talking about your mother, I mean, it, I actually did tear up, right. That's so real um, for us, uh, especially I think as, as children of immigrants. Um, but in any case, before I ramble on, um, I really, I do want to wrap up and I just want to say thank you so much to all of us to all of you for joining us today. Um, obviously, thank you so much, Aram and Lisa. Uh, if you enjoyed today's program, I wanna remind you, we invite you um, to join us for our next Artist Activist Dialogue, which is on Thursday, March 31st with Quenna Lene Barrett and Jian Lee. Um, we also have a number of wonderful events coming up, including our Women's History Month keynote presentation on women's leadership in medicine, featuring, featuring Dr. Chiquita Collins, and that's going to be on March 29th. Uh, for those of you who are at UIC, we have a teaching workshop for women and gender nonconforming faculty of color tomorrow, March 18th. Um, and we're also hosting a casual drop-in conversation about women in gaming on March 30th. You can find info about all of our upcoming events on our website, which I will drop into the chat, or perhaps I think Kelly has already. So thank you, Kelly, for doing that. Um, thank you again, Aram, Lisa, all of you for joining us today. We hope to see you all again soon and wish you a very good afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Here's thank some you. hearts. <laughs> Take care, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.